this chapter, this, the first part of this chapter is actually very easy. Um, it's the second part when we get into the actual acids and bases. Um, I think it's easy that's, that, no, no, listen. The first part's not too bad. Really, it's not. That, now, when you get into the second half of this, and you get into what acids and bases, and, and you get all these ions and that kind of stuff, yeah, that, that's when it gets, that's, gets hard. Um, hopefully, we can lecture. This, was, um, this is going to be the chapter. At the end of this chapter is where it would have been very beneficial to have a little bit of chemistry background, more than any other chapter that we've talked about. But I'll do my best. We'll, I'll try to work through it as, as we go along. Um, now, the first part, though, is just things that you could actually just read over and, and get on your own in terms of, you know, when I say, what is the internal pool of a substance? Well, first of all, this first half is just about fluid balance, okay? Um, how we can maintain certain compositions of, of fluid throughout our body. We talked about the kidneys. We talked about um, nephrology and, and how these concentration gradients play into how much is excreted, how much is reabsorbed, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Throughout the body now, we've got to take that situation where we have uh, fluid changes in terms of concentrations that happen in the kidney that then trickle down and end up, you know, it impacting the rest of the body throughout the body tissues. Um, if you, for example, if you increase the amount of sodium that you're keeping in into the blood, you retain more sodium, realize that systemically what happens is more water goes in everywhere, into the blood from everywhere, from all parts of the body tissue. So, you know, what happens in the kidneys puts something into the bloodstream that's going to infect, uh, not infect, affect the entire body, okay? Um, now, so this is sort of just in general fluid balance, okay? Fluid electrolyte balance. Um, the second half of this, we're going to talk about acid-base balance. We're going to talk about respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Uh, how do you know which one you got? What can you do about it? That kind of stuff. Uh, but... When we talk about the internal pool of a substance, it's just a, a, I'm talking about how much of that is in a pool just kind of sitting around in the ECF, in the extracellular fluid, in the tissue fluid in the body. Okay? Um, now, these are some pretty straightforward things here that are on this slide. It says the quantity of a substance is stable if the input is balanced by the output. Well, no kidding. Um, whatever you put in, if you balance that by whatever you take out, then obviously you've got a sort of a stable type of situation, a stable pool. Um, for example, you can eat a lot of salt, but as so long as you can are able to excrete that which is past what you need, then you can maintain that homeostasis. And this is what our body is constantly doing. Okay? Um, <clears throat> you constantly have some exchange happening between the pool and other internal sites. The pool, remember the, the ECF, stuff's constantly having to come in and out of the cell in, in an exchange with, with this, this pool of stuff that's in the ECF. Um, <clears throat> glucose and glycogen get converted. Remember, when you, when you consume something, your digestive system, as we'll learn in the next chapter, your digestive system strips it down to glucose, and that can actually, it's capable of entering the cell. And when it goes into the cell, we go back to like chapter two, back when we get into the electron transport chain, all that kind of stuff. You know, the Krebs cycle before that, glucose coming into the cell, glycolysis before that. So, I mean, this takes us all back. Everything becomes connected at this point. We know that Sometimes you take in more glucose in a setting, like you know, yesterday when I sat down and absolutely gorged myself. Um, you, you take in much more than what you actually need at any given time. Um, so what does your body do? Re it's, it'll store it away in glycogen. It's animal storage, animal starch. Um, sort of like the starch that you get in plants, except it's different. Um, it's slightly chemically different. And what our liver can do is monitor between meals and take readings of the blood and see that, okay, the glucose is a little low. I'm going to take some of this glycogen, pull it out, um, undo it, split it apart, get some glucose out of it, and shift it around the body and, and put it through circulation. So you constantly have this exchange coming back and forth. Okay. Um, also, not just a movement. Um, I, I mentioned incorporation down here for a substance that incorporate to incorporate into something else, into a more complex molecule. I, I mentioned the example of iron. Iron is, is in our pool, in our ECF. It's floating around. It's, you know, all over our body, in our tissue fluid, in our bloodstream. Sometimes iron gets incorporated into other things, especially hemoglobin. Um, it's when, when iron in, gets incorporated into the hemoglobin molecule, that's when it becomes functional, <laughs> the hemoglobin anyways. Um, and oxygen is actually the point where, or sorry, Iron is the point where oxygen can bind to that hemoglobin. It's sort of a little site that the, the oxygen can stick to. 
Um, so <clears throat> there's there's a lot of stuff getting moved around and, and taken in and stuffed in other places and that kind of thing. So now if I ref reference a positive or a negative balance, it's in reference to your reference point is the inside of your body. For example, if we say you have a positive balance, that means inside your body you've got more than what you're getting rid of. Okay, your input exceeds your output. You're consuming too much sodium, more sodium than you are actually being able to regulate and excrete. So therefore, you have a positive balance of that. Negative is whenever the inside isn't as much as the outside. Uh, your output actually exceeds your input. That's a negative balance. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'll mention this again a little bit later, but generally the input into your body is very poorly controlled. Um, think about food. Think about eating. Um, <clears throat> we have the thing that tells us to stop eating. We have mechanisms in our body that starts to tell us, okay, we're full. Uh, we'll talk about all that with digestion and hormones. Uh, some things that start telling us we're full and to shut down this, this want and desire to eat and that kind of thing. But realize that, by and large, you have conscious control over this. Some things you don't have conscious control over. Even if you're hungry, you can decide not to eat. Okay? Um, <clears throat> as hard as it may be, you can still decide not to eat. Um, I'm not trying to say any more about that other than the fact that that is not a physiologically controlled mechanism. Uh, our body does not do a real good job in terms of regulating what we put in it. What it can do is regulate it once it's in there. Okay, that's, that's the point of what I'm saying here. So that's why I say input is, is not, not very well controlled. It doesn't do a lot to prevent things from getting into your plasma. It just sort of deals with them when they're there. That's the way our body works. Um, all right. So our, our adjustments to compensate a large part of that happens in the kidneys. The liver and the kidneys, is, and we talked about the kidneys um, and all that stuff that moves across them, where things like large drugs um, and, and organic compounds and that kind of thing can get a, they, they don't get through the Bowman's capsule, but over here at the end in the, in the distal and, and, and collecting ducts, distal tubule collecting ducts, they can get pulled back into the kidneys from the bloodstream. Um, all this sort of output is how we compensate. Um, and that's all through urinary excretion. All right, um, now, body water. Obviously, we're a ton of water. That's, that's most, of our, most of our weight. It's the most abundant substance in our bodies. Um, I will say that the amount varies in the different kinds of tissue in the body. For example, uh, in adipose tissue and fat cells, hardly any water at all. Um, and in most other cells, especially you know, di you know, things like involved with digestion and that kind of stuff, there's a much, much higher percentage of water in those. Um, but overall, in terms of average out in the body, we try to keep our concentration of water relatively stable. That's how come we're constantly uh, getting rid of excess. We are taking in when we get thirsty. You know, it's not like you just wake up and you drink a glass of water one time a day and you're done. I mean, you've got to constantly throughout the day maintain this homeostasis and follow your body's signals. Okay, about two-thirds of the water is intracellular within your cells. So 67%, oh, we'll say, of... of Body, uh, the water that's in your body is actually inside the membrane of your cells, within that, okay, the cells themselves. Now, the other one-third is actually in the ECF around the cells, okay? Okay, um, now, in the ECF, so one-third of all the water that is in the ECF, of that one-third, one-fifth of the water in the ECF is actually in the plasma. It makes up your blood plasma, okay? Four-fifths is in the interstitial fluid, which is the tissue fluid. Now, remember, when you think back, it gets a little confusing because you think, okay, what's the difference between tissue fluid and the extracellular fluid? Well, and the extracellular fluid is a combination of two things, tissue fluid and blood plasma, because technically both of those are outside of the cells, so we call that extracellular fluid. You can separate extracellular fluid into interstitial fluid and plasma. That's the only difference. Okay? And you'll notice that of that, all of the ECF water, whether it's tissue cells you know, outside the, in, within the tissue itself, between the cells and the tissue, interstitial, whether it's that fluid or blood plasma, okay, uh, most of it is actually between the cells, outside of the blood plasma in the tissue. Okay? All right. Then you've got some that you can find. Um, some water, high, higher concentrations of water can be found like in the lymph and transcellular fluid is fluid that's moved between cells and, and, and can be traced from one place to another, that kind of stuff. But, um, and of course the lymph and the lymphatic vessels, there's going to be some higher concentration of water there to carry those cells. 
things where they need to go. Okay, um, now what I do want to point out here is um, the, well, basically this picture right here. They'll sum it all up if you take a look. Um, <clears throat> the composition of your blood plasma and your interstitial fluid should be close to the same in terms of what makes them up and the percentages of each thing's there um, because they are both part of the ECF, right? The plasma and the interstitial fluid. So that means that they should have a similar composition, and they do if you look here. Notice that sodium. There's a lot of sodium outside of cells, right? Because sodium comes rushing in, like in nerve cells and stuff, when threshold is reached. So there must be a high concentration of sodium on the outside of the cells, not the inside. And you'll find that the opposite is true. Here's the inside of a cell, the ICF. You should find a lot more potassium, right? It should be opposite where you find sodium. Okay? Also, you'll find a lot of chloride ions outside. Um, in the interstitial fluid, in the uh, blood plasma. How do you remember this? Just remember that sodium and chloride always go together. Okay, so wherever there's a lot of sodium, there's going to be a lot of chloride. And whenever there's a lot of sodium, potassium is going to be opposite. There's going to be very little potassium. And if there was a, a barrier here, like in this case the plasma membrane, if there's a lot of sodium outside of it, there's going to be a lot of potassium on the inside of it. Um, so, as far as composition, you can see that it's very similar, small differences, but it's very, very different when you get into the ICF, and that plasma membrane helps regulate that, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right. Notice the barriers here between the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid. Watch your barrier. It's your blood vessel wall, okay? That's, that's the physical barrier, the capillary wall. What's the barrier between the interstitial fluid and the cells themselves? It's the plasma membrane. Okay, of those cells. Okay. Um, this is summarized in that picture. So you can go back and look at that. This bottom, these bottom bullets down here. Okay. Um, all right. Now, realize then if you can change the volume of your plasma. How can you change that? Well, first of all, you can mess with the osmolarity. You can mess, mess with the things that are dissolved in it and, and create and cause water to move. If you concentrate it, get more things in the plasma, you draw water in. Okay? Um, if you can increase the amount of water or the volume of the plasma, um, you can affect the volume of the interstitial fluid because they're the same. I, I mean, they're, they're, they're similar. Um, and they have to cross into one another. Stuff is always leaving and leaking out of the bloodstream, out of the blood vessels into the interstitial fluid. So when you affect one, you end up affecting the other. Um, okay, I want to mention a word here, osmolarity. I wanna, want you to make sure you understand what this means. If you see osmo, you think of osmosis, movement of water. Okay? <clears throat> Molarity in chemistry has to do with concentrations. It tells you how concentrated something is. Um, for example, think back to the lab we did, the diffusion osmosis lab. I think we had, uh, what, like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 molar sucrose. The higher that number, it had a big capital M after it. It stood for molarity. The higher the number, the more concentrated it was. So osmolarity is going to be basically how concentrated, how many things are dissolved inside what you're talking about. Okay, the more things that are dissolved inside of it, the higher concentration it has. And the higher the osmolarity. It's going to be able to draw water out. The, the, bigger, the, the bigger that number, the more concentrated it is, the more water is going to want to come into it. Right? Think about that and think about your data that you had for that lab. Okay? Um, the more concentrated sugar solution uh, produced more osmosis. It brought more water. In. So that's osmolarity. Okay, how concentrated it is, it's going to draw water in towards itself. Okay, so obviously this is going to have a huge impact on blood pressure because the, the more concentrated solutes become, for example, within the bloodstream, the more water is going to want to come into the bloodstream. It's going to increase pressure because it's going to end up increasing the blood volume, and it's still got to push against the same wall, so the more that's stuffed in there, the more the pre higher the pressure becomes. Okay, <coughs> um, <coughs> what you'll find <coughs> is cell volume is also very important. You don't want your cells shriveling up or exploding, one of the two. You don't want that happening. 
obviously. So the, re the way that we have to do this is we have to maintain, now we'll go back to a long time ago, we also talked about hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic solutions. Um, it has to do with is there more solutes on the outside, more solutes on the inside, or the same in terms of the cell and its environment. If there's more salt, okay, think about it, review. If I have a cell and I have it in what's called a hypertonic environment, hyper means too much. And what I'm talking about here is solutes that are dissolved. If I have a cell that's in a hypertonic environment, that means there's too much solutes dissolved out here. Which way is the water going to go? In or out of the cell? Now remember, remember, here's what we have. Think about it. I have a hypertonic environment. Here's the cell. Whoa, it's big. Here's the, it's going to be a flagellated, flagellated cell. Um, I have a cell, and I have a hypertonic environment. That means I have a lot more stuff dissolved out here than what I have in here. So what does that do in terms of percentage of water? Where's, where's, which one of those, in here or out here, has the highest percentage of water? That's right, in here. Okay. So which way will water want to move? That's right, out. Another way to think of this is... Well, what happens when you add salt to your meat? Well, <laughs> if you're cooking, it, gets, it, gets it well, it dries it out. That's right. Okay. If you add salt to your food while you're cooking it, preparing it, I mean a lot, you know, a little bit, not good, but if you add a lot to it, what's it going to do? It's going to draw it out. You salt cure thing. That's what you do. You can you can dry it out. So it's sort of like it's not chemically what's happening, but. It's sort of like it can act as a sponge and kind of just pull the water out of something. So wherever the salt is, that's where the water's going to go, right? Where if the salt's on the outside, it's going to draw the water out of that food to the outside, and it's going to evaporate because it's hot, and you're going to remove moisture content from that food. Now realize what's actually happening is it's not bonding with the water. It's not soaking the water out and pulling it out. All it's doing is setting up a situation like this so that the water naturally wants to diffuse out and out of those cells, out into the environment, and when it reaches the outside... It's so hot because you're cooking, it just evaporates away, and you lose that water. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the same application, though, applies because wherever the salt is, so goes the water. You put too much sodium in your bloodstream, where's the water going to go? Into your bloodstream. If you have too low a sodium in your bloodstream, you're not going to have enough water going into your bloodstream. Okay? Um, in this case... If we have a lot of salt on the outside, we have a hypertonic environment. Hyper means there's an elevated amount of solute concentrated on the outside. Okay? We have a hypertonic environment. It's going to draw that water out through osmosis. Okay? All right. So what you're going to find is we want in our cells an isotonic environment. We don't want our cells to lose a bunch of water and shrivel up. We don't want them to be in a hypotonic environment where... There's more salt on the inside than there is the out, so it draws water in. We don't want to do that either. We have to maintain an uh, isotonic situation. So we're constantly in uh, flux, constantly in uh, uh, chasing homeostasis to make this happen. Okay, so that's why we've got to regulate this extracellular fluid's osmolarity. We've got to regulate all of these things that are floating around the outside so that it doesn't draw water in places where we don't want it to. It can have huge impacts on our health. Okay, so here it says salt has water holding power. In other words, um, where, the, where the salt is, is it's where the water is going to be held, wherever it's located. It's going to draw it in that direction. Okay, <clears throat> like I said, back to input-output stuff. If you want to talk about salt, it depends on your input and your output. It depends on how much you put in, and it depends on how well you regulate it once it's in there. Okay, whether it's through kidneys... Um, general things like thirst, or you know, that would be water, but you can dilute, like the amount of salt that you have, you can put in more water and, and dilute that, make it less concentrated, that kind of stuff. Um, but the only salt input we have is by ingestion, naturally. Um, and because we have such variable eating habits amongst us, it's, you know, physiologically it's not very well controlled in terms of our salt input. Um, I'm not saying that you can't control it at all. You take psychosocial factors, you know, culture, uh, psychology, uh, and, and some biology with a lot of people, certainly, there's no doubt about that. 
Um, but the bottom line is, is not that there's no control at all over it. I'm just saying it's, it's in terms of how well our body controls everything else, there's very little control when it comes down to controlling input of something. Okay, <clears throat> so our salt balance, for example, is mostly maintained in the urine uh, by the kidneys. So that's, that's how we're going to get rid of stuff we don't need and hold in it, hold it in if we, if we do need it. Okay, uh, this stuff we already know, having discussed you know, glomerular filtration, we know what that is, at least you're supposed to, um, having already discussed kidneys and that kind of thing, so we don't need to go over that again. Um, okay, we know that if we can control blood flow, say we, we reduce the amount of blood flow to the gl uh, glomeruli, um, and we push less blood through that, we're filtering less. So if we filter less, obviously there's going to be more sodium that stays in the blood, okay, as opposed to gets pushed out into the urine. So that's one way we can save on our salt. We don't excrete that much of it. We can um, use blood pressure. We can use plasma volume and circulation. All this will tie together. And that's one way to read. And if our body reads that we want to retain some sodium, one of the things that we can do is down at the glomerulus level, reduce the amount of blood flow going through there. It'll hold back the sodium. That we need. There's a lot of other things that can happen. Um, also, think back to this. The renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone mechanism. We had angiotensinogen floating around the liver, and angiotensin 1 uh, was released and produced by um, <coughs> cells with, w around this, this nephron. Um, when it gets into the lungs and it passed all the way back up to the lungs, it came in contact with an enzyme called ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, converted into angiotensin 2. Um, and then that would go into make its way back down to the kidneys again, but get into the actual adrenal glands where um, it caused the uh, adrenal glands to produce aldosterone, which ended up affecting blood pressure. Okay? So all these things, the way that it affects blood pressure is going to control salt. Okay? Um, it will signal, that hormone when present can signal the distal and collecting tubules um, to increase or decrease sodium retention. If more sodium is allowed to come in, or in other words, it doesn't really make it more of a come in, but it can slow down that which is being pulled out. If it shuts down some of that um, and, 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 can, and, and more sodium is, is enters the bloodstream or, or less of it enters or whatever, you can control um, osmolarity. Not as much sodium means not as much water. More sodium means more water. More water is going to come in. It's going to increase the blood pressure and try to shift things back to normal. All right. And this is a summary of that. If you've got a low <laughs> amount of sodium, okay, uh, your body notices you need more sodium, it's decreased. What's going to end up happening is you're going to see a little bit of drop in blood pressure. The less sodium you have, the less water is coming in is contributing to blood pressure. So you see a little bit of drop in blood pressure. What does your body do? What are a couple things, anyways, that it does to, to answer this? One's on this side, one's on this side, happening simultaneously. One thing is there will be a signal to the kidneys to slow down the glomerular filtration. That way, not as much sodium is leaving. That's basically what that means. You decrease the amount of filtered sodium. Keep it in the bloodstream. Okay, so you get rid of less. You lower the excretion of sodium and accompanying chloride and thus fluid. If you don't excrete as much sodium, not as much fluid leaves because it follows the sodium with osmosis. So keep it in. Hold on to that water. Don't let it go out. Let it, let it stay in there and contribute to help, to help raise that blood pressure back up where it needs to be. So you conserve your, your sodium okay, and your fluid. and Thus, that will relieve the problem that you started with. Over here, happening at the same time, um, you'll get this decreased blood flow, this drop in sodium is going to trigger that angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. And eventually, it's going to lead to the production of aldosterone. And when it does, it's going to cause your collecting ducts, especially, to absorb more sodium, pull it back out. Not only are you conserving, you're actually pulling more back out as well. So you're taking the stuff that's in there and not letting it out. And then you're taking the stuff that is already out and trying to put it back in. So you can see how this all works together. And those together are going to lead to more sodium in the bloodstream and thus more fluid in the bloodstream, which will take us back up to here and fix our problem and counterbalance this drop in blood pressure due to a low sodium supply. Okay, um, I already mentioned this. It says the osmolarity is a reference to the solute concentration. 
Um, how concentrated is this in terms of sodium or potassium or, or whatever? Okay? Generally, when we talk about osmolarity, it's sort of a generic term. You can certainly focus on one ion. You can say due to calcium or, or potassium or whatever. But generally, when we're talking about here, sort of everything mixed together. Just in general, the fact that things are dissolved affects water movement. Okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> we've already talked about all this, but you know, this is how we're going to control it. We, we play with these levels. Our kidneys play with these levels a lot. And by manipulating them, pumping some stuff out, by doing that, everything follows. You can, you can create these gradients, and things will fall along those gradients. Okay? All right. <clears throat> We already know this. Um, you should already know this. Like I said, to reiterate, sodium high in the ECF, potassium high in the ICF on the inside. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There's a lot of other ion distributions I could have you memorize, but there's really no point. I mean, we, we get the general idea here. Uh, you could you could take a look at calcium levels. You could take a look at phosphate levels. Um, several other things. But. All right. So normally, though, we try to keep things the same. Yes, it may be true that you keep more sodium on the outside of your cell and more potassium on the inside of your cell, but there's more, a whole lot more things out there besides just sodium and potassium that can make up the difference in terms of osmolarity. If you have a whole bunch more sodium on the outside and a whole bunch more potassium on the inside, you probably have a whole bunch more of something else on the inside than you do the outside of, of another chemical. So what ends up happening is what our body tries to do is amazingly, is to balance all this out so that you have equal amounts of concentrations of things on both sides. Whether it's, it's not, doesn't have to necessarily be the same ion, but, but everything that's dissolved. Try to balance it out so that water doesn't really want to go one way or the other, except whenever you want it to, when your body controls that. Um, so we try to maintain isotonic conditions. We try to maintain uh, equal concentrations across these barriers so that water doesn't move. Okay. All right. I already talked about hypo and hypertonic. <clears throat> we know that if you're in a hypertonic solution, you've got too much salt around the outside of the cell, right? So it's going to draw water out. That's why I say cells shrink. Um, how does this apply to the body, though, quite clinically, for example? It can certainly lead to dehydration because <clears throat> um, when you set up a a hypertonic condition where there's too much dissolved solutes going through the bloodstream and drawing water out of your Like, for example, if you drink seawater, there's a good, there's a good, you know, imagine drinking a whole, if you're thirsty, so you drink a whole big jug of seawater, realize it's, you know, 3% sodium chloride, and you're putting a whole bunch of sodium and chloride ions in your body going through your digestive tract, coming in contact with cells all along the way, actually drawing moisture out of the cells. It's actually, water is, is osmotically moving from the inside of your cells to the digestive lumen, mostly in that case. And of course, you load up water in the digestive lumen, you know what's coming out the other end. Um, probably something high concentration of water. Um, so you're, you're, you're moving it in, you're moving it out. And when you do that, you're actually pulling more, and you're, you're drawing water out of these cells, and you can dehydrate very easily. So you know, that's an extreme example. But realize at the same time, you've got to regulate these ions. You've got to regulate these electrolytes because if they get too high in the bloodstream and that kind of thing, you're going to start drawing water out of the tissues. Sources include insufficient water intake. If you do not drink enough water, what ends up happening is the solutes are still there and they just become more concentrated because more water means you're able to dilute them, just like anything else, right? You could take something... You know, a scoop of something, let's say it's, it's a miracle Grow or fertilizer or whatever, um, you know that you have this one scoop, you can dissolve it in a half a bucket or a whole bucket, and you know that in a whole bucket is far less concentrated because you spread it all around over a larger area, there's much more water there. Same situation here. Um, <clears throat> insufficient water intake means you're not have, bringing in enough to dilute it down and to balance out, and, and you're, you're leaving behind a high concentration um, electrolytic solution. Diab excessive water loss. Um, that could be diarrhea. That could be a whole lot of other things. Um, diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is not diabetes mellitus. That's what you're used to. Um, diabetes mellitus has to do. Diabetes is in reference to something in the urine. Okay? Diabetes mellitus got its name because glucose comes over in the urine and we can detect it. That's, that's where it spills over, where it's easy to see. 
Um, so in this case, we're talking about a urinary condition, diabetes, but insipidus, which means excessive. You, there's, there's a problem retaining water in the body, and you produce uh, a lot of urine, usually dilute urine, but you lose a lot of water through that. Generally, it's hormonal, and I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, well, it looks like I'm telling you right here. I thought I was going to wait till I did not. It says, in diabetes insipidus, there's a deficiency of vasopressin, which is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Remember, ADH is, is natural. We need it. Um, and it helps us retain water when we need to. In a person where that's not working, whether it's genetic, whether it's you know, autoimmune, who knows what, something's wrong with that person where they don't retain the water that they're supposed to. That signal isn't there, so all of it kind of just goes out and there's excessive urination. So um, Now, <clears throat> maybe this explains some things. I don't know. But the shrinking of neurons can, can affect brain function. Okay? Um, if you have too high of salt levels, for example, circulating through the body and your, your, your balances are off, and what ends up happening is you draw moisture out of body cells, that's one thing. Um, but when you start drawing moisture out of neuronal cells, especially brain cells, CNS cells in general, um, that's, it, it renders them dysfunctional. And they don't repair themselves, remember, like normal body cells do. So um, in that case, we got a problem. Uh, blood pressure can decrease. A whole host of things can, can go wrong when you start messing with CNS uh, and, and, and your neurological types of cells. Uh, but now, in the other uh, example, this was hypertonic and a hypotonic. We said there was too little on the outside. So that means more higher salt level would be on the inside, and the water would follow that, so it would come in and it would swell up. Another way to think of it is hippo and hypo. The cell swells up like a hippo. Um, all right. <coughs> Made me think. Never mind. But no, I, I think about a. I just saw it the other day a long team poly. And that that guy on the day. Can I tell you a story about the hippo? He was telling about the hippo, and it's never mind. Anyways, um, all right. What could cause a hypotonic environment? Um, you know that that means again, sort of like one or two things: either too little solutes on the outside, or else way too much water on the outside. Either one of those would have the same effect. Renal failure um, with water retention, and if you start w retaining water, um, I mean, and you guys, you know, you, this is something that, that you can certainly come, come across. Um, you start retaining water, one of the big things that's going to happen, there's a lot of other things that can happen, but um, this osmolarity becomes very important because you start retaining water, uh, what ends up happening is you, start, you can create a hypotonic environment to the cells in which case there's actually ends up being higher solute concentrations on the inside as opposed to the outside, and you start drawing um, some water into the cells. Now, that may not seem bad because it's, it's sort of dealing with the water that's interstitially, um, but it is bad because you don't want to draw water into the cells and swell them up. That, that renders, can render those cells dysfunction. So. Especially when we get to neural cells, like I said, with neurons and that kind of thing. So. Um, For what? What's the condition? I wasn't sure. Oh, probably. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And in, in this situation, I mean, if he's got a kidney problem, I don't know what's, what's. Well, and you don't know who, it, it, that's a whole host of other things, too, because, you know, the second you're diabetic, if you get glucose spill over in the urine, um, the, the fact that it's there now, I'm not saying this is a cause, but something you can certainly think about is once that's there, that's a solute now that's dissolved that's going to affect all the other solutes and all the other water movement. And not only that, it, it you know, that's one of the things that happens with diabetics is, I don't know his stage, but as you get worse and worse, kidney failure is, is one of the things you have to worry about. Uh, and the kidneys get overworked because there's so much glucose bombardment and um, <coughs> the, the glomeruli wear down. There's a lot of this becomes more susceptible to infection. So the two are, I'm sure, closely related. Um, di diabetes takes a toll on the kidneys. Um, and if it's a case where um, you're retaining water, 
and you're not filtering out, for example, as much as you should of the things. Um, and some of that stays in the bloodstream. You're going to start retaining water. You're not going to produce as much water. It's going to stay in. It's going to cause you to retain water. It's going to increase blood pressure. It's going to do all those things. Um, and, and that's why, of course, that, like you say, you limit water intake and also sodium intake. I mean, we all know that, right? High blood pressure, they always say, don't eat so much salt, all that kind of stuff. And that's why they're all related. I, I don't know, I mean, obviously, the specific things. But yeah, there's um, got to be a relationship there at some level. <laughs> okay, um, overhydration. You can actually overhydrate as well. And, the, and, the, and the, one of the things is, and people don't realize too, and, and I think about this, but like for myself, but it's not going to have enough of an impact because I'm not nearly that physically active. But um, <clears throat> the, um, like, uh, if you run a lot, say like, you know, 15 miles a day or whatever, anybody? <laughs> um, the, well, okay, well, but um, the, uh, one thing that, you know, you don't want to do is drink a lot of, you know, just pure distilled water um, because that's just H2O. There's no solutes. There's no minerals. There's nothing else in there to affect concentration. And realize that if you do that, that could play in a, it could have an effect on, on osmolarity um, because if you're not, if you're loading up on pure water, it may quench your thirst, but at the same time, you are creating a hypotonic solution. You're actually diluting the outside of all of this, and you can end up concentrating stuff um, like on the inside of cells and that kind of thing and actually end up drawing um, <coughs> water into your cells and that kind of thing. So you got to you know, realize that there is such thing as overhydration. That's, that, of course, is the whole theory behind Gatorade and, you know, uh, and, and mineral types of water and, and, and things that are replenished that aren't just pure water. I mean, no one really drinks distilled water, but you can go into the store like at Walmart. And you can buy distilled water jugs. Realize there's a difference between drinking water and distilled water. And... It's not like one is, is worse and better and dirty and clean or anything. It's just one is pure water. It depends on what you're using them for. One is pure water, and one is you know just purified water as opposed to just with everything removed. Distilled water means you boil it away so that, and you collect just H2O molecules in gaseous form and then recondense it, cool it, and you have pure water, leaving all minerals behind. Purified water is different. It's just filtered and it's treated and that kind of thing, so there's a lot of other stuff in there that's you know, not going to hurt you, but certainly there's more than just water molecules floating around. Um, most of the time, the bottled water thing is just a scam anyway, because <clears throat> half the time it's tap water from another state. They just put it in there, and they ship it out, and they slap a new label on it and say, from the springs of Colorado. In other words, from the PVC pipes of the bar downtown Colorado, and then they, they ship it out. Do some research on that. You'd be interested. Also, one of the things is, too, about bottled water. Is no, it, it, no, it's not. It, it's not. It's not bad for you, obviously. It's just it. The whole thing doesn't make sense to me because you think that oh, you know, it, it's got to be cheaper, right? I mean, in terms of it's water, right? And you, I mean, how if you we do this large scale enough, everyone just starts drinking it. Realize that the cost. You start thinking about like a, a bottle of water costs like a buck, same as a, a bottle of pop. You know, and it seems ridiculous. They spend more money actually making the bottles and shipping this stuff everywhere. There's so much cost with just that than, than the, the water itself. It's just it's dumb. The whole thing is dumb. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. <laughs> no, no. Hey, I drink it too. I, I drink bottled water too. So, I mean, if I'm calling anybody dumb, I'm calling myself dumb too. I'm just saying it's dumb. It is dumb. And then what you want to do is research these different kinds, because some people say they taste different too. But, but go on go on to Dasani, go on to Aquafina, go on to Nestle, and find out the process, if you can. Maybe they won't have it on their site, but you can find it from somebody. See how they bottle it, see where it comes from, that kind of stuff. You might be surprised. All right. I don't really care. <laughs> long, as, long as it's not from the, the, the creek in my backyard. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is, too, about, about, about the creeks in the backyard, I mean, we have some nice, pretty, clean, clear water running back through there, but it's, there's so, many live, so much livestock around. Who knows what's in that water, you know? I mean, it's... 
it's clean, it's clean, but, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to be down there, you know, wading in about this high, catching minnows, and my, my daughter's back there, and then I'm leaning down, I'm going to take a little drink, I look up, and there's like a dead sheep carcass up there somewhere, <laughs> just like, the water's flowing down. <clears throat> yeah, but it's assuming it won't kill me, that's, that's the actual part I'm worried about. Um, <clears throat> all right. <laughs> it's amazing. You think about that crap. Like, and my, well, like, you t- my daughter, how, I don't know, never mind. Yeah. You know, why do they do this? Why do they eat these things? And you know, then you, after the third one, you give up trying to stop them, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know what? You eat it. <laughs> you see what happens. <laughs> it's like, well, it's like I was telling you, too. Okay, so what does she eat? No, it's just anything. I don't know. No, I don't know. No. But I was thinking about, you know, too, like, like, like this whole, she's in this questioning. My oldest one's in this sentence questioning today. You know, it's like, put your, put your seatbelt on. Why? Why? Slam on the brakes, and I'll show, you show her why. And I said, why, Daddy? <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Enough said. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> For all those visual learners. <laughs> all right. <coughs> <coughs> all right. Um, as far as how do we get water into our body, we talked about how ADH can help control it, control osmolarity. How do we get water in? Obviously, fluids, liquids, drink that. Um, we actually get a, a lot of water just from solid foods that we eat. Um, some animals actually don't drink any water. They actually consume all of the water that they need from the food that they eat. A lot of like lizards or reptiles in the desert and that kind of stuff. It's kind of neat. Um, and of course, we metabolically produce water as well um, through all the reactions in our mitochondria, um, through the elect- uh, through the, end- the electron transport chain. Remember, oxygen is there to accept the final electron when it does. Um, when oxygen combines with hydrogen, ultimately what can happen is the formation of water out of that. So that's, that's where some of it can come from. Um, as far as output, how do we get rid of our water? Well, urine is the biggest way. Uh, we get rid of a lot of water that way. But also we breathe out some water. Uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor are the two biggest things we breathe out. So, um, All right. <clears throat> um, I say vasopressin and thirst control output and input simultaneously of water. Realize that vasopressin... Um, is controlling output. It's, vasopressin is going to cause more sodium to be reabsorbed back into the blood and thus put more water back into the blood, right, to increase blood pressure. So that's controlling the output. Thirst then, realize to get to vasopressin, um, <clears throat> one of the things that happens at the same time is that whole, uh, well, one thing that affects thirst is the whole angiotensin, renin and angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, one of the things that does is activate thirst. So while that's going on, thirst can control the input as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> We have in our hypothalamus, which we'll talk about in the endocrinology chapter, which you've probably already heard about, um, is sort of the, the big processing region and sensory region of our brain in terms of homeostasis. It, it gets a lot of signals there. Uh, we have osmoreceptors that can detect osmolarity. As the blood travels through, remember, there's a blood-brain barrier. There's only one place where our blood can come in direct contact with our brain tissue, and that's in the hypothalamus, okay? because our brain cells at that region have to be able to interpret and to measure and, and to work with the actual things that are in our blood at that point, to measure the concentrations of things and read it. So <clears throat> um, our hypothalamus is able to look at the dissolved stuff, how much of it's there, take a reading, and send signals to adjust accordingly. Okay? Um, so it can cause secretion of vasopressin. Um, it can cause you to be more thirsty, less thirsty, all that kind of stuff. So, all right, <clears throat> that's the whole thing put together. You can reason through that on your own. It's what I just said. But these two work in conjunction with one another, and all of it will come back to um, increase ECF volume, increase increase blood pressure. Okay. <clears throat> um, Let's see what we got here. Same old stuff. Um, we still got. Realize it's a it's a negative feedback cycle. Okay. Um, if you 
if you have a high enough blood pressure, if you have a, a greater blood volume, more arterial pressure, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to decrease that per se, but what it will cause us to do is secrete less vasopressin because what vaso, vasopressin is doing, vasopressin and ADH, remember, the same thing. Uh, what vasopressin and ADH are, will, is doing is bringing more water in okay, through, through movement of sodium, causing our body to reabsorb more sodium, bringing in more water. Um, what we do is then nothing to counteract that, but just slow that down. And if we slow that down, then we don't bring as much in. Okay, so that's that's what that's saying. Um, and then of course, if we have a low blood volume, low pressure, we do just the opposite. But that would increase the amount of this um, vasopressin (ADH), and we would bring more to raise that, bring more sodium in, water in. Um, <clears throat> we've already talked about this. We mentioned this with renal. The whole angiotensin thing, that's what leads to aldosterone. Aldosterone is also going to bring in sodium. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so here's, the, um, it, what it can do is angiotensin too. Realize that vasopressin is different. Okay? We've got the whole uh, angiotensinogen in the liver gets converted, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1, in the presence of, you know, it, it all gets converted over. But when angiotensin II is floating around the bloodstream, making its way to the lungs, realize that also what this can do is interact with this chemical and cause it input to output, sorry, to, to increase. Okay? So it all works together is what I'm saying. They feed off of each other. Uh, as this has been activated, remember the signal, original signal for this came from the kidneys. As that was activated and that's circling around, it's also going to cause, react with other receptors and cause even more vasopressin output. Both are going to increase fluid inside the, the blood vessels and increase blood pressure, that kind of stuff. Okay? Um, cause you to be thirsty, which will even compound that even further. Um, now, there's other inputs, stress related. We know that blood pressure can increase with stress, so um, that can affect, actually, it's been shown to affect vasopressin outputs. It can cause the, the release of, uh, the, the body has a normal stress response. It's supposed to be triggered and, and induced by stressful situations that threaten survival. So we have this way of dealing with stress. The problem is, and so many of us in our lives, and you know, I'm just as guilty as anyone, allow that stress response to happen far too often and, and far too long. Okay? Um, and mentally, we can put ourselves in that state. Physically, we can put ourselves in that state. And as this stress response happens, <clears throat> you know, realize that these are, this is a short-term response that our body is supposed to have to help us survive and to, to, to help us meet threatening situations. It takes a toll on the body whenever it's, it's strung out and it lasts too long. Cortisol, remember that? Go back to that. That gets released. It starts mobilizing things and, and we lose weight, right? When we're, well, it depends. I mean, if one of the things that you do when you're stressed is eat as a result, then that's counterproductive. But normally, you know, like for me, I know that whenever I get really stressed, I actually stop eating and I don't eat as much as I should. So one of the things is you can, you can lose weight, but that's not a healthy way to do it. Cortisol, and also you're going to lower your immune system. When that cortisol thing comes in and starts working and mobilizing your, your, your stores of energy and, and getting that out in the bloodstream, another thing that happens is your, 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 blood, your white blood cell work goes down. Your immune system stops working as well. So then all of a sudden, you were stressful. Now you're stressed and sick, which makes you even more stressed, right? Um, so it all works together. Um, not only that, but you get an increased secretion of vasopressin in the body because the stress response is generally when you're threatened with a, a situation to survive, one of the things you want to do, your heart wants to beat harder, your lungs want to start breathing more, you're going to get bronchial or dilation so that you get more airway going through there, you're going to get vessel constriction to increase the blood pressure to force it where it needs to go even faster. Um, so, you know, in this case, vasopressin will get kicked in to try to increase your blood pressure but that's really not what you need at the time, but that's what your body is trained to do because, you know, from a biological perspective, that's, that's what we would want to do. But things have changed. We've evolved past just existing now. Now we're a much more higher functioning type of, 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 of animal. So um, Now that will not affect thirst, um, but it can affect the amount of vasopressin that's present. Um, so that's going to increase your, your blood pressure as well. Um, some animals have the ability to control your water input by what's called oral water meter. I'm not going to say too much about that, but realize that some animals do actually have a very controlled intake that's sort of subconscious. They don't think about it. It sort of just shuts off once they've um, brought in a certain amount of water. We don't really. 
and we just keep going until we're on Thursday. Um, <clears throat> habit and sociological factors also regulate water intake. And I say these are not physiological. Um, I think of like, uh, you know what, it, not that I have any experience with this, of course, but um, <clears throat> you think about like uh, back in the day whenever maybe you consumed some more beverages than, than maybe what you do now. Um, <clears throat> whenever you start doing that, it just sort of keeps going. It's like you're not thirsty. You just keep doing, you keep putting more water in your body. Um, <clears throat> sociological factors, you know, um, Habit, sort of like, you know, think about the people who smoke, you know. Some people will just say they can't, it's not even so much, that it's, it's always the nicotine, but it, some people just can't stand and not have it in their hand. Uh, I know people that, that claim this. They just, they, it, it doesn't feel right without having the cigarette in their hand. It's just weird. Um, so, I mean, habits like that you get used to and you don't realize it. But, you know, as far as water intake, you know, if you're used to doing you know, if you're used to getting a pop every time you stop at the gas station or whatever, you end up putting more or, or getting water or whatever. I mean, these are just kind of everyday things that um, could, could certainly affect levels like that, but not to the point where I'd say you have to worry about it. I mean, we have good things to tell us when we're not thirsty anymore or when we are thirsty, but uh, realize there's a lot that, that plays in on that. Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to move past general fluids and... Um, electrolytes and that kind of thing. Hopefully that wasn't too bad. It was a lot of stuff we kind of already had mentioned before. Here's where it gets a little more challenging. Okay, and it's not, it, it's the same concept in terms of things moving and all that. Um, but it may throw some words at you that you haven't heard before <clears throat> and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about acids and bases, what they are, why they're important to the body, what they can do, what they can impact, how we can control them. We're going to talk about buffer systems. Uh, just like in, uh, in our life, we'll say, you know, this person was a buffer, or that's a, it was a bit buffered the situation. You know that it sort of controls it, kind of neutralizes it, that kind of thing. Uh, that's what a buffer will do. And we're going to look at this. Okay? So first of all, just in general, before I start talking about all this, I'm just going to set the stage as to what a little, little short lecture on acids and bases. Okay? Um, <clears throat> An acid is a chemical that has the ability to release hydrogen ions. I'm assuming you know what an ion is. An ion is an atom that has an electrical charge associated with it. Okay? So instead of just a hydrogen atom, it's actually a hydrogen atom with a one positive charge. It's lost its electron. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So an acid is something that can donate hydrogens, basically. Now, the problem with that is... Whenever you have this, what's called dissociated hydrogens, they, they've fallen, fallen apart, they've dissociated. When you have hydrogen ions that are floating around in, in a solution, they are very reactive. And what they will do is they will react with other things that can cause a lot of bad things to happen. They can pull things apart. Um, <clears throat> they can put things into solution. You know, you drop a piece of metal, um, depends on the metal and the acid, but say iron, drop a piece of iron into concentrated hydrochloric acid, and you'll see that iron disappear. Now, what happens is, in hydrochloric acid, you've got a chemical that's HCl, hydrogen and a chloride ion, and the second that they get put in a water solution, they actually are dissociated into their separate ions, and they're floating around between all the water molecules. And what will happen is, if you put a piece of iron in there, <clears throat> the acid will actually pull apart that iron and put those iron atoms, change them from being charged neutral and, and, and actually strip away their, they can, you know, that, that whole process can strip away their electrons to the point where they start to float around, pull it apart and stretched out and floating around into solution. Okay? Now, those iron atoms, all the iron that was there in that lump has not disappeared. It is still there, it's changed form. It is no longer in solid, but all the atoms have been pulled apart, and now they're all floating around in solution. So you can actually look through it, and you can see that it looks like it's disappeared. But actually, um, you know, if, if we were in chemistry, it, we could go through ways to pull that back out. You can actually go through a series of reactions and actually cause that iron to re-precipitate and put it back you know, like it was. You get solid iron again. So it's there. It doesn't disappear. So 
So keep that kind of thing in mind. Now, what I, in this case, we're talking about acids and bases, and we're also going to mention the pH scale. Now, first of all, a base. A base, just like in, in, in baseball, softball, whatever, you know that a base is something that accepts a runner. Okay? It's the same analogy with hydrogens. A base is going to be something that is going to accept the hydrogens that are given off by acids. Okay? So acids are going to give up hydrogens. Bases are going to come along and be able to absorb hydrogens, to pull hydrogens and latch onto them. Now, that means that acids and bases have the ability to work in pairs. What one gives up, the other one takes. <clears throat> there are also things called strong, uh, there's, well, there's strong acids and strong bases, and there's weak acids and weak bases. Okay? <clears throat> the difference is how well they dissociate when you drop them in water. Okay? If I had HCl, if I had dry solid molecules of hydrochloric acid, which would be HCl, one hydrogen, one chloride ion together, and I took that, that sample and I dissolved it in water, what I would see is that once it's in water, the H's and the Cl's completely separate from one another, and they're just bouncing around independently all through that water solution. Okay? That was what you would see with a strong acid. A weak acid does not dissociate nearly as well. There's something about it chemically that causes it to hang on to its hydrogen a little better than what a strong acid would. So the reason that strong acids are called strong acids is because they're so much stronger at getting rid of their hydrogens. They're so much more potent in terms of reactivity. So things like vinegar, which is acetic acid. Acetic acid is a very weak acid. And if you, had, if you could look, you could zoom in with your molecule goggles and <clears throat> look at a sample of, of acetic acid in a cup, or, or you're at Long John's, and you take the vinegar there, and you could zoom in and look at the acetic acid molecules present, what you would see is you would see a bunch of what's called acetate ions in a hydrogen. Those two things together make acetic acid, okay? Just like hydrogen and chloride make hydrochloric acid. If you, you would see a lot of acetate ions and, and hydrogen ions stuck together, and you would see a few separated out, floating around. That's what makes it a weak acid. It doesn't dissociate near as easily as what a strong acid does. The same thing is true for bases. Um, really strong bases like to give off a certain ion or, or, or produce a certain ion, a certain charged particle. It's called a hydroxide ion. A hydroxide ion is OH negative. Maybe you've seen it before. Is it up here? I don't know. Yeah, right here. Hydroxide ion. Okay? It's an oxygen and a hydrogen that, that floats around as a group that has a charge with them. Now, here's what happens. When a base, sodium hydroxide, Drano, is a really strong base, okay? strong bases can come in contact with strong acids. Let's say I have HCl. I put it into a solution. I've got H's and Cl's floating around. I take a really strong base, sodium hydroxide, drop it into solution. I've got sodium ions and hydroxide ions floating around. Sodium hydroxide is Na for sodium and then OH after it. Okay? So they're going to separate around. Now what I've got here is hydrogen ions floating around, hydroxide ions floating around. And I've also got some things that don't really matter to me. I've got some sodium ions floating around and some chloride ions floating around. Okay? When I mix these two things together, I take something that's very acidic that if I poured on my flesh, it would eat it away. Then if I took something over here that's very basic, if I poured it on my flesh, it would eat it away. It's just in the opposite direction. That makes sense. Think about, okay, hydrogen. If I dumped hydrochloric acid on my arm, I would put a whole bunch of hydrogens on my arm. And those hydrogens would penetrate my tissue, go down and start pulling apart my proteins, and start reacting with this and actually turning into solution the flesh on my body. Okay, if it was constant. <clears throat> on a base, if I did it the same, the same way, what it would do, instead of donating those hydrogens that go down into my tissue, it would pull the hydrogens from my tissue. That's what it would do. It really likes to take, electron, uh, take, sorry, take hydrogens instead of give them. But both suck really bad. Okay? It doesn't matter. Either one's going to be extremely painful. It's going to look the same from the surface because you're going to get a deterioration of tissue. All right. <clears throat> now, if I take sodium hydroxide, though, 
And I take that same sodium hydroxide that could burn me, and I take the same hydrochloric acid that can burn me, and I dump them together, and I swirl it around, I can drink it. Okay, now why? Because all the hydrogens that come from over here, and all the hydro, assuming that you don't just try that. There's a little bit of math. There's a little bit of math that goes into this. You got to make sure the concentrations are the same. Okay, so don't go home and saying that you can do this. Um, run it by me first. Um, but you can take the hydrogens here, as long as you have the same amount of hydrogen and the same amount of hydroxides over here. Put them together. What do you think happens when you take an H and an OH and you put them together and you got two H's and an O? Well, high quality H2O. Okay, H2O, water, which is perfectly harmless, right? So hydroxides, hydrogens come together to make neutral water. They neutralize each other. Now what's left in there, if you taste that after you drink it, it may not taste too good because what's left over? Sodium and, which is, what do we call it? Table salt. It's salt water. That's what you got left, Okay. So take a little, let's see, well, we can do this at home. Take a little Drano. Take a little muriatic acid from Lowe's. Mix them together. Drink it. And it would be salt water. Okay. But you might not want to take your chance with getting your calculation right. But anyways, that's the bottom. Feed it to your dog first. See what happens. Um, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the idea. We've got... Bases and acids, they work together. Now, what is this whole pH scale thing? pH stands for, just in case you're on Jeopardy and you need to know, because I don't think it tells you on here. <laughs> pH stands for potential hydrogen. What it, it's a number that reflects and tells you the potential of your solution to have free hydrogens floating around. Okay, so the more acidic something is, the more hydrogens that are floating around. However... Don't get confused because on the pH scale, something that's very, very acidic has a very low number on the pH scale instead of a high number. Okay? See if I can show you why. <clears throat> you guys remember scientific notation from math class? Uh, don't be so thrilled about it. Okay, let's take this number right here. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7, right? Can you, can you see it down at the bottom? Let me pick a different color. Ah, I picked a bad color. Hang on. Black. Can you see that? I can't. I can't see it. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. Right? Now, to, to make that a bigger number, what would you do? Or, I mean, to, to sorry, to make it like you would normally read it, not scientific notation, where would you move the decimal? To the left, that's right, because this is a really small number, right? So you would have to move the decimal place over seven places, and you would see that there will be a whole bunch of zeros and then that one, okay? Let me ask you this. Let's take this, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. Which number is bigger? That's right. The pH scale has to do with this sort of situation, the reason that it goes down on the scale to make it stronger is because whenever you actually, the pH scale was designed around hydrogen ion concentrations, how concentrated the hydrogen ions were. But they're really, really small. The pH scale only applies to like bodily type of situations where there's not a whole lot of acid. Like you know, if you took the pH of hydrochloric acid, you can't use it on the pH scale. It'd be off the chart. It's, it doesn't make sense. It's designed around specific concentrations, a window, for example, that exists in, let's say, biological world. Um, so, in, a perf in pure water, in pure water, <coughs> there's hydrogen and hydroxide ions together, right, making up water. If you look at pure water at room temperature and you measured how much hydrogen was present, you would see a value in what's called molarity equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. So, pretty small hydrogen. You don't, obviously, hydrogen ions make things taste very sour. Their German name are actually sour, okay? Um, sauerkraut. Things that taste sour are made with, like, those candies that are sour. They actually have, like, tartaric acid on the outside, those little crystals. They're really sour. Um, <clears throat> when you drink water, it's certainly not sour, so it's not very acidic. 
But there, is, there are a few little hydrogens present in there, and that's how many, we'll say, in terms of concentration, 1 times 10 to the minus 7. What is the neutral on the pH scale? Anybody remember? 7. 7 is neutral. Okay? <clears throat> if you get a higher concentration than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, that number actually gets smaller, right? Could be the minus 5, could be times 10 to the minus 4. All of those are actually bigger. But since we use these numbers right here as our scale on the pH scale, so when you go down on the pH scale, realize that you're actually applying this, and you're actually making that number bigger in terms of the concentration. So that's why it's backwards. OK. <clears throat> well, do what? 7 is not the strongest, but it's the middle. It's, it's, a, it's all relative to pure water. We, what we do is we look at the concentrations of things and compare it to pure water. And pure water is this. If it's higher than that, like this, minus 5, we say it's acidic. There's more hydrogens present than there would be in pure water. Sometimes we can go higher. We can go, or sorry, a lower number, higher exponent. We can go 1 times 10 to the minus 11. That means it's very basic. That means it has far fewer hydrogens even than you would find in, uh, in pure water, which, remember, what makes up water, hydroxide and hydrogen, if there's a whole lot fewer hydrogen, that means there's going to be a whole lot more hydroxides present. So these would be anything above 7, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way up to 14, you're going to find our basic solutions. Okay? They, they're more basic than water. They have more hydroxides present. Things that are below 7 have more, more hydrogens present than water, so we call those acidic solutions. Okay. A high pH. A high pH is alkaline. That's right. Alkaline is the same as the base. Use that word interchangeably. If you have an alkali or alkaline situation, you have a basic situation. We'll stop there. <coughs>